My guest today is Carol Proper. Carol is a professor of economics at Imperial College Business School and at Bristol University. Her research focuses on health economics and on the impact of incentives on healthcare systems quality and productivity. Carol is president of the Royal Economic Society and has just been made a dame in the New Year's honors for a contribution to economics. Hello, uh, Carol. It's really fantastic to have you here. Thanks for your time. Um, we've been doing lots of interviews, but we haven't really had a chance to talk to somebody who can really tell us about the health issues and the consequences for the long term uh, of the pandemic. So it's really, really great to, to have you here. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, um, so, so um, you have been very vocal, particularly about the cost in terms of human capital and health of lockdowns which have been uh, basically implemented in, in most countries, uh, including now potentially in many others that are going back into these, to these measures. What are the long-term health consequences of lockdowns? Do, do the short-term health benefits, uh, you think, uh, offset the long-term health consequences? What's your sense about what could have been alternative or, or, or what, how good, what's your evaluation of this policy? Okay. so. Essentially, what we drew attention to was the fact that when you have um, a lockdown, you have an economic shock, as we all know now. Um, and that economic shock has an impact on longer term health. So essentially, there's a large literature on the impact of economic recessions on later health. And what that literature shows is that the impact of economic recessions, in this case brought about by the lockdown, on future health can be quite big and long, it long lasting as well. So some work that colleagues and I did for the UK showed that if you have an economic recession, it can lead to a large rise in people who have chronic and ongoing health issues. And particularly within that, people who have chronic and ongoing mental health issues. But that isn't really kind of factored in when you think about people doing the kind of calculus of what the current impact of a lockdown is. It's all in the future. But our work shows that it's not only all in the future, but it's also worse for places that already have bad health. So it has a, an additional inequality impact, if you like. So that's kind of the cost, the long-term health cost of having an economic shutdown. Obviously there's, an, there's a work cost, which might itself have an impact on people's mental health. So for example, not being in work now is associated with lower mental health. We know that. So all of those kind of costs have to be set against the kind of current health gain. And the current health gain is really treating people who have COVID. And within that, really the current health gain is in many countries protecting the health system from being overwhelmed. And I think initially, the whole health system just shut down in order to protect people from being overwhelmed. And we had lockdowns in order to protect the health systems from being overwhelmed. I think as the pandemic's gone on, we're better able to manage the people in hospital and to treat them and to get them out faster. So I think we need to be more worried as the pandemic goes on and as we learn more about what our future health impact will be of having a lockdown to protect the current health system. So, so give us a sense of this magnitude. Uh, you, you studied the, the uh, 2008 crisis and, and what's, what's the kind of, of impact uh, on health and how many people are affected uh, just to try to get a sense of, of these costs and benefits you're pointing out. Yeah, we think that, so we looked, as you say, at the 2008 recession, which is smaller than the recessions that have occurred from COVID, quite a lot smaller. And we estimate that probably that recession from 2008 led to about half a million people more having chronic health conditions. 
So long-term health conditions, particularly mental health conditions, but also other conditions like um, COPD, respiratory conditions and musculoskeletal conditions that come with, associated with not working and that are associated with being out of the labor market. But we think particularly it's going to affect mental health. We think the impact of the 2008 recession on mental health was quite big. We think the COVID impact might be twice that size. So possibly up to a million more people in Britain suffering from mental health conditions. Do we have any sense about the, the equivalent figure by now I, for, for the current, the current uh, crisis? We have read a lot of anecdotal evidence about health uh, issues, particularly mental health issues, as you're pointing out, uh, children's health, uh, kids who are not in school and are at home. Uh, do, we, do we start to get a, a sense of this magnitude or it's too early to tell? I think it's still too early to tell and there are some quite interesting, I mean, it's clear that there are particularly vulnerable groups and as you've pointed out, one of them is young parents with young children, young mothers um, are likely to, we, we know women have been very affected by this pandemic and more affected um, and that they've been ending up doing more childcare at the same time as trying to work from home. We also know that a lot of young women work in industries that have been particularly hit by pandemics. So we, there's probably going to be a knock-on effect on both their health and the health of children that they have, because they're obviously young women have children. I think it's a bit early to tell, and there are some odd features of a pandemic, which is that normally when you have a recession, it affects some people and not others. When you're all in lockdown because of a pandemic, it might be that some of the mental health problems are ameliorated by the fact that everyone is locked down. So for example, now, you know, we're all having this debate in the uh, Western world about what we're going to do about Christmas. Everyone is going to have a different Christmas. And it's pretty clear that after Christmas, everyone is going to be locked back in their houses except for essential workers because the virus is just spreading so rapidly in Europe. So I think that gives you a slightly different dimension. So it makes it quite difficult to do the kind of calculus you want to do. It is true that one of my colleagues from Imperial, David Miles, has done a very kind of crude back of the envelope calculation of the lives saved due to treating COVID shutdown the, the COVID lives saved compared to the other costs. And his analysis suggests that the lockdowns will cause much bigger costs than the immediate cost of the lives that are lost due to COVID. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, do you want to finish the thoughts? There? No, I was going to say, but that's quite early analysis, but I think what's very clear is we don't yet know, and I don't think we'll know for kind of two or three years as the effects rumble through. And when we see whether people can shift to other sectors to get employment, or whether there are some sectors that are just shed um, workers and those workers have trouble finding new work. I mean, a million, a million people with mental health and other health issues uh... It's a lot, it's a lot of people, if that's the long-term consequence, we, we have to be very worried. Um, let, me, let me jump from people to the health systems, which as you said, saving the health systems was, was a big part of the purpose of all this lockdown strategy. Um, what have we learned about uh, the ability of health systems, particularly you, you've studied in particular the British one, the NHS, um, their preparation and what should change over the medium term? What, first, let's start with the diagnosis. How, how have they done? I think, well, health systems have been differentially affected across the world, depending a bit how those health systems are paid for. So in a system like the NHS, um, the government switched very quickly to pay hospitals not for activity, because they were cancelling all kinds of activity, but to give them funds that were not related to activity. And they also poured a lot of money 
into buying PPE and buying other equipment. They didn't organize that very well in Britain. <laughs> so there was a lot of shortage of equipment at the beginning. And that's probably because they were not very well prepared for this kind of pandemic. And for the NHS, that's partly because the NHS runs at very close to total full capacity all of the time. In a normal year, it's very close to full capacity. When you have a pandemic, you can see that, that, that there's real problems. So I think any of the European healthcare systems that run close to capacity, like Italy, like Spain, like France, have had problems, well, less in France, but Italy and Spain, as well as Britain, have had problems because they already were very close to capacity and then they were hit by this enormous shock. But there are other health systems that have done even worse. So in the US health system, what's happened there is hospitals make their money out of non-emergency care. They cross subsidize between emergency care, which is loss making and elective care. COVID has meant that they've canceled all of that elective care for things like hip and knee replacements. So there are many hospitals in the US that were already in financial trouble that are now just disappearing. And there are areas, particularly rural areas, that are going to lose their healthcare facilities completely. That at least has not happened in European systems. So one obvious lesson that you are pointing out seems to me then, obviously we need to have excess capacity in the system, so we need to build some, some buffers. What are other key lessons for the future that you think we, 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 should, we should now really take into account in order to avoid these kind of, 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 of changes, dramatic changes in the allocation that, that can hurt uh, people with, with non-immediate uh, COVID-related needs or pandemic-related needs? I mean, I think the, the key point is the one you make. You need excess capacity, not just in terms of physical capacity, but also staff capacity. Because we are going to get, as the world is very global, we're going to get more and more of these pandemics. Many people were actually suggesting that a pandemic might come at some point, especially after SARS, which people have kind of forgotten in the West because it didn't affect them very much, and MERS too in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But those voices were kind of ignored, I think, with, with a focus on sort of daily activity. So I think, in order to have resilient healthcare systems, first of all, you need capacity. Secondly, I think you need some way, which Britain is not very good at, at having local response. What the pandemic has shown is that places like Germany that have very strong local public health and very strong federal organization rather than, than very strong regional organization have managed to mobilize resources much better, have managed to do things like track and trace much better. Very centralized systems in the main don't help you when you have a pandemic because the rate of the pandemic will affect different areas differently and different populations differently. So particularly in a centralized democracy, um, you probably want to design your healthcare system so you have more regional power and not have all the power at the center. It's very hard for the center to make all these decisions. And I think England is a classic example of an over-centralized system. I think the Spanish system, for example, is much better because you have a decentralized system where uh, the provinces have more autonomy in their healthcare system. And I think that builds in safety nets. So uh, there, there is clearly an implicit in your in your statement the question of, of what type of decentralization is good, because my understanding is that the actual management of the hospitals, these, these NHS trusts, right, has been over the period of time decentralized. But in some sense, you're saying that's not quite what is needed. I think it's needed, but what you need on top of that is probably a more local level above that, a regional level. Mm -hmm. Britain used to have a regional level, 
But in Britain, what's happened is there's been a strong centralization of government across the board in education, in, in health, in transport planning, in whole areas. The British state has become more and more centralized. And I think that has hurt the healthcare system. You need a kind of regional layer so that you can respond differently in different regions. And it was very clear that in the early stages of the pandemic, the center took back a lot of powers that it had given to the local level. That's always the instinct of any organization. It doesn't matter whether it's government or business. When things are difficult, the instinct of an organization is to centralize. But you don't really want to centralize when you've got a public health emergency where local information is really important. Mm -hmm. So let me let me continue on this uh, management issue. Um, you, uh, we had we had recently Rafaela Sedun and, and uh, from Harvard, and she was arguing that that better management is associated with, with lower mortality rates. Uh, you also talk about uh, about competition as a as a good uh, feature. Um, how does competition improve efficiency, and and, and how do we um, introduce competition in this kind of public health systems? Okay, so I think the, the literature on competition and efficiency is really a literature about competition and quality. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence now that suggests that when you have hospitals or doctors who compete with each other, that raises the quality of care. Whether that be family doctors competing with each other or hospitals competing with each other. So we've shown that quite extensively for the UK, but there's evidence on this from the US. There's also evidence from countries like Norway, Sweden, um, other, other institutions. Now, introducing competition within public sector bodies is really about designing your financial system so you reward for better performance. So that's kind of linked to the big drive to pay institutions in the public sector for the quality of the service they provide, either the quality of education that they provide or the quality of healthcare that you provide. And that's really the way, that's one of the pieces that you need for competition. The other piece that you need for competition is you need choice to be exercised by either patients or by buyers on their part. If you're locked into a particular supplier, either as an insurer or as a patient, you can't exercise any of the, the kind of choice that you need to exercise for competition to work. The only sort of um, issue that can arise is if you have very monopolized health system already and a private health system like in the US, you might want more monopolized insurers in order to have better bargaining between them. But that doesn't tend to occur so much in other systems than the US, where there's been a big trend towards consolidation. But I think even in the US system, I think there's a generally a belief that more allowing more competition, allowing more choice, and using mechanisms to, to do that, um, particularly financial mechanisms, is beneficial for the quality of healthcare. Uh, one, one aspect through which this, this uh, competition uh, intervenes, uh, and that you, you have pointed out in your research, is the improvement on, on management, so the, the effect of competition on, on the quality of management, how well health is, is managed. What is this mechanism and, 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 and how does this actually better manage it, management show up? What is the exact uh, mechanism through which this is? I, I think that's a great question. What we know is we know that competition leads to better outcomes. We also know that better management leads to better outcomes mm -hmm. and that competition is associated with better management. I think what we don't know partly because economists aren't perhaps the people to answer this question. What we don't know is exactly how 
product market competition translates into better management. You can think about channels by which it does. If you think about paying people for quality, better management can help you put in better quality procedures, better ways of ensuring that, 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 that kind of competition, you can see that your, your competitors have better quality, you therefore change your management structures to be able to bring about that better quality in your hospitals. But I don't think we fully understand that link yet. And it's obviously a fascinating link, particularly for the public sector, of how exactly what you should do in terms of your management to improve in order to respond to competition. But it's clear that some people do. So, so the, the usual negative uh, view on this, on this topic um, could be, I mean, my wife could be one example. She's a tertiary um, hospital physician, a pediatrician on, on rare illness, on fibrosis, uh, cystic fibrosis. Yeah. And she complains that all these incentives and competition and measurement, what it does is it prevents the very high in time intensive uh, patients who, who need a lot of care, multi-organic issues, et cetera, with lots of specialists from actually receiving that care if uh, this doesn't really show up in waiting time statistics, et cetera. So an issue here is how does this uh, improving uh, tag, how do we prevent improving this emphasis on targets from actually decreasing the quality of care? And you've written about this. You, you talked about targets and tell, which I think is a fantastic description of this phenomenon. Well, I think the... To start with, first of all, let me say no professionals like being monitored. Okay, sure. <laughs> the second thing I'd like to say is that many professionals are dedicated to improving the quality of care or the quality of the services they do, and in healthcare, the quality of, of, of healthcare. The third thing I'd like to say is that, in fact, many professional doctors are extremely competitive. Um, in terms of benchmarking their performance against other people. Mm -hmm. So the trick here really is to make sure that the outcomes that you're measuring are the outcomes they believe in and rather than the outcomes that are imposed on them. And I think a quite nice example was, as you say, the targets and terror work that we looked at waiting time. The British government was very keen to bring down waiting lists. Waiting lists are a feature of the British uh, system because we don't pay for healthcare at the point of demand. And a lot of clinicians anecdotally said that what waiting lists would do would make them take the less necessary patients who were waiting a long time before those who were more urgent. We actually studied that and we found no evidence of that. There was no evidence that people were treating, inappropriately treating people who had minor illnesses faster than people who had more major illnesses. And it was also clear that having waiting times targets led to a big reduction in waiting times. And we were able to do that by comparing England, which had waiting times, with Scotland, which did not. And in Scotland, waiting times actually rose and the government ended up hiding them by designating a new category of list. <laughs> eventually got discovered and they stopped doing that. So I think it's all about designing what your targets are and you need to design those targets with professionals. We know that from literature on pay for performance and indeed on using targets that it's really important that professional deliverers of the service are involved in that process and believe in that process. You, you, uh, you argue even making these, these targets public, which I actually like very much, but indeed, I, I remember uh, a study in, in, in New York, I think it was, where uh, surgeons who were faced with report uh, cards on survival rates, they chose to operate the easier, tar the easier patients to boost their numbers. So designing these, these objectives in a proper way is, is, is a tricky thing to do. It's very tricky, but I think we have a long history now of knowing exactly 
not knowing exactly how people respond to targets, but being very aware that there can be some negative targets. So the example you give is exactly, it's a very early system in which outcomes were made public. So doctors who had bad outcomes either moved to another state uh, where their outcomes were not monitored, or indeed, as you say, they picked patients for whom it would be easier to achieve those outcomes. But we do know quite a lot about the technicalities of designing such systems and how we should design them and also looking out for bad behavior or inappropriate behavior or behavior that would harm patients. I mean, I think, you know, the science of economics is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Right. You may change somewhere and you're going to have a change somewhere else. What you want to do is have policy that net improves things, but there will always be some what's that's what there's no such thing as a free lunch means. So absolutely, we, we, we <laughs> that is the essential truth in economics, very much in agreement. So um, another another um, uh, angle that you've looked at is the impact uh, on, on mortality and other outcomes of pay regulation. Um, to what extent does actually uh, of uh, setting up pay regulation has out, has the impact on hospital performance. What is what is the what is the evidence that you have uncovered, and what's the mechanism? Yeah, well, this is this is something that's very specific, really, to public health systems which use pay regulation to set national wages. It's common in healthcare systems that are sort of NHS type systems, but it's also the area where actually it's very common is teachers. But broadly in many, in many public services that are provided by the public sector, you see that what the government does is it regulates pay at a, a large, at a high level, either at the national level or perhaps at the regional level. Now that contrasts with what private sector firms do. Private sector firms often pay different wages in areas that have high cost of living compared to areas that have low cost of living. So for example, in the UK, there's a minimum wage that's London specific because London is very expensive. And that minimum wage is higher in London than it is in other places. But when you, and the, the reason that governments often set pay to be the same across all public services is it's kind of believed that a nurse should be paid the same regardless of where she works. The problem with that is that for her, the cost of living is much higher in some areas than others. So work that I've done in the past has looked at what impact that has on patient outcomes. And what we found is that in areas where the cost of living is high, the regulated wage means that outcomes in those hospitals are less good. We've subsequently done more work and we think the reason is that when you have high cost areas and regulated wages, what you get in those hospitals is more people leaving more problems with people um, recruiting people and also more people switching between employers. So that has a cost for our employer because they're always having to try and recruit and retain people and they're not able to pay wages that allow them to retain people. So they have this problem of a lot of churning of staff. And that leads to staff demotivation. Um, so yes, um, you need to again think about, I think, thinking about not having national regulations, but perhaps having regional regulation of pay. Mm -hmm. But the, the UK government is very unusual. Well, it's not unusual, but it's very, very centralized. And I don't think often the consequences of this high level of centralization makes politicians happy, but I don't think it's very good for the, for the promotion of good public services. Mm -hmm. 
So, so let me let me switch gear a little bit and talk about inequality in health. This has been a, a major uh, concern for you. Um, first, you've you've actually looked uh, broadly at at, at, at uh, international comparisons at inequality um, between different uh, health indicators and income indicators. What is the evidence of this? What what are the main determinants and the main patterns that you see? Well, there are kind of two things in the inequality of health. I mean, one is the relationship between how our healthcare system treats people. And the other is the broader question of the association between income, education and health. So really when we're talking about inequality and health, we're talking about the latter, the relationship between income and health or between education and health. I think what's clear in all OECD countries is that there is a very strong association between income, early childhood and later health. Um, but there's also a relationship between health and income. So it's kind of difficult to actually be definitive about the causal relationships. But I think we know, for example, for example, in France, there are, practic there are big differences between uh, how long a person with high education lives compared to how long a person with low education lives. They're quite striking differences. By the time someone gets to 60, their life expectancy is much less. Uh, for men, I think it's about nine, 10 years if they're low educated compared if they're high educated. But I think the, what causes that inequality is a, a lot of factors. Very important is early life. So early life uh, chances affect later health. And I think we've got growing evidence that that happens. But then there's also the kind of work that you do, the kind of environment that you live in, and all of those things are socially graded. So poorer people have harder work, often have more physical work, which causes more, more physical problems. Um, poorer people also live in areas which tend to be more polluted and that causes uh, poorer health as well. So it's a very complex pattern, but it's a very clear pattern that socioeconomic inequalities in health exist and continue to exist even when you have healthcare systems which treat people fairly. And I think the reason is that we need to shift away from thinking about healthcare systems being able to treat this and thinking about more broader social and economic policies to give people better jobs, to give people better skills, to reduce pollution in our cities, um, to give children of poor parents or children of low educated parents a better start in life. All of that will reduce health inequalities. But you, you, you do, I mean, it, it does seem clear that, that that's a key factor, but you do point out in your work that, um, for example, comparing Sweden and the UK, that, that the correlation between health outcomes and income outcomes uh, is, is very different between those two places, uh, even though both seem to have similar a priori health system, etc. Beyond the socioeconomic factors uh, controlling for those differences, what explains the way different health systems uh, experience this? Is, is it the health systems themselves or, or what is it? I mean, I really think that the role of the health system in all of this is quite small, but then mm -hmm. nevertheless, on top of that, when you have systems in which you have people paying for their health care, either co generally co-pay, um, there are further barriers, if you like, to, to trying to treat health um, and to try and reduce some of those inequalities. So it's clear that, for example, the US system mm -hmm. in which there are groups of people who are uninsured and groups of people who have access to less care because their insurance is less generous, less good care or less, less care because their insurance is less generous. And they will, that exacerbates underlying health inequalities. I think 
the European model of pretty much full insurance on the uh, consumer side is one that is one that tries to redress some of the health inequalities that come from other factors. And it does mm -hmm. that better than insurance systems or systems in which what you pay for healthcare depends on what you earn. So, I mean, just, just to, uh, to, to start to conclude, I, I, I wonder, um, going back to the pandemic into future pandemics, um, I have, I have two, two, two thoughts that I wanted to, to, to pose to you. The first one is um, two questions. Um, when we talk to economists studying value chains like Poland trust, uh, trade, like Stefan Rosigan's geography, they tend to think that there will be a very full rebound from the pandemic and very fast because the physical capital has been untouched because people are, are really ready to, to get going again. Yeah. Um, you, at the start of the conversation, you put one big question mark there, which is you, you to the extent, I guess, we haven't got cycled back to the economic consequences of, of what you pointed out. To the extent that health outcomes will be and health levels will be long term very affected by 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 the by the economic by the lockdown etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, could we expect that that in turn uh, is going to make the recovery slow and difficult, or is this now second or third order in, in your mind? No, I don't think it's second or third order. I think the health issues that come from the pandemic and the fact that the pandemic we've what the pandemic has done has been to expose existing inequalities and exacerbate those ex inequalities so the people who have not been able to work during in across all countries are those who are poorer are those who are predominant in the service sectors um, and are those who are younger Mm -hmm. and also some older workers who are getting towards the end of their lives. And the, the pan so basically there's been a whole year in which individuals of those, in those classes of groups of people have suffered extremely from the pandemic. And those individuals don't live everywhere. They tend to live in poorer areas often in areas where there's less other work than the service sector. Um, so I think what we're going to see from the pandemic is an increase in inequality and associated with that, an increase in inequality of health. That some areas of countries will rebound back very fast, that some people, particularly richer people, are hardly affected by the pandemic at all. They're also the owners of capital. So they're not, you know, that when trade gets going again. But I think what the pandemic will have done is expose those inequalities and leave us with a group of people who are really harmed. Young people who would have entered the labor market and who are, there's the danger of scarring, the children of those young people and people who live in areas where there is very low employment to start with, uh, particularly where employment is very dependent on the service sector that's been hit so hard. So rural areas, for example, that depend on tourism, they may bounce back a bit, but there's a whole generation of people that would have been affected in those areas. Um, that, that's, uh, that's a worrying, that's a worrying uh, um, thought for, for, uh, for the future. Now, mm. last, uh, last question. Um, Carl, what do you think of the um, key lessons uh, for future pandemics? What we talked about capacity. If, we, if you wanted to, to like tell governments, there are three things that you need to do uh, if there is a pandemic in April 22, and, and I hope not. What are the things that in April or March 22 we need to do much, much better than we did in, in, in 2020? What are the key? Uh, things that you would say, well, look, if you want to repeat the experience, let's just get ready in these particular ways. I think, obviously, the capacity, you need to be thinking about your capacity. 
But I think the second thing that's quite interesting from, from looking at how countries have responded is that what you want is you want your politicians to do things such that the populace trusts them. There have been several examples of countries where there have been high levels of trust in the government, and those high levels of trust have been associated with high levels of compliance to lockdown measures and to measures for social distancing. So politicians need to build that trust very fast. What's interesting is that some of the governments headed by women who are more consensual in their behavior mm -hmm. appear to have done much better in terms of trust. Obviously, the, the star example is Jacinda Ardern in, in New Zealand, but she has a country that's an island and a small mm -hmm. island. So it's <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yes, it's not really, it's in the middle of the Pacific, yes. <laughs> but, um, it's far from all the uh, traffic, guys. Well, but it's want to be at the cost to the New Zealand economy in a big way because they've had to shut all their trade. They're a very open economy. They've had to shut their trade, they've had to shut their tourism. But she's taken the population with her. The population were prepared to make that trade off because the way the government worked there was to involve citizens, to talk directly to citizens. I think in complete contrast in Britain, politicians have kind of stood around with loud hailers on the top of their houses of parliament and made announcements to people. People have got irritated or confused and not felt involved and you can see that as the pandemic has gone on, that governments which are authoritarian and do not consult with their populations within a Western democracy type front are having trouble in this third wave of getting their, their uh, um, populations to comply with regulations that their populations find confusing. So you need to work very hard on public trust. And I think you can see that in the US that nobody has public trust in the government partly because of the behavior of the leader of the federal government <laughs> during the pandemic. And that has very bad uh, impacts on how you respond to a pandemic. It does indeed. Well, Thanks very, very much. I think we learned an awful lot uh, today. It was really insightful and, and really interesting. Thanks for your time. Um, Thank you. Um, very nice to talk to you. Thank you.